August is Rural Broadband Month at the Federal Communications Commission. The Commerce Committee uh, just today in a hearing uh, put forward nominees uh, for the commission, and the commission does matter, but I want to talk today specifically uh, about highlighting the importance of broadband uh, in rural America and rural Missouri. Uh, in January this year, I joined a number of my Senate colleagues on a bipartisan letter uh, to President Trump regarding the importance of broadband uh, and expanding access to all of the country, and particularly the country that's not currently served. Uh, as part of any infrastructure legislation that the Congress is talking about, I think the administration needs to consider policies that think about infrastructure not just solely in terms of roads and bridges and ports, and they're important, and particularly, Mr. President, where you and I live in Missouri and Arkansas, that transportation network means so much to us, uh, but also important is how people are able to communicate and how people are able to compete. Uh, High-speed internet access can't be overlooked as we look at what our infrastructure should look like going forward. Broadband can be delivered by wireless technology or wireline technology. It can be brought to customers by traditional communications companies uh, in rural areas. Often now rural electric co-ops show great interest and capacity to do this, as do others. But following the significant steps that the Congress took to, to, to deregulate the market as part of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, uh, the broadband industry has really responded. They've invested a lot of money. In fact, they've invested $1.5 trillion of private money to, to deploy better networks and faster networks and if you have access to one of those networks, you know what a difference it makes. Uh, just uh, in 2015 alone, uh, that's the last number I have access to, the investment by traditional wire line uh, companies, by wireless companies, by cable providers was $76 billion. And all that is really good, except, Mr. President, there's a real divide between rural areas of my state and rural areas areas of the country and and other other more populated areas the, the some people say well oh that's just a myth there's no digital divide uh, I'd really have them look at any number of articles one in the Wall Street Journal in June made the point that 39 percent of the United States rural population lacked access to broadband that sounds like a pretty big divide to me. 39% of, of the entire rural population of the country doesn't have broadband. 61% of rural Missourians lack access to broadband. And these numbers are just not acceptable. Uh, most private divest investment has been uh, directed, as you would assume it would be, toward high population, uh, highly populated, and easily accessed areas and future customers. Um, and whether, you know, this is sort of like the same problem, Mr. President, that the country had 100 years ago, transitioning to telephones, and the same, same problem, hard to get uh, a telephone to a house that was five miles away from the nearest house, as opposed to a house that is in the same apartment building as the nearest apartment. A lot harder to do that. And so the government at that time said, oh, we're going to put a universal service fee on every phone bill so that everybody has equal access to what was obviously seen as a really important and dividing way to communicate your health problems, your economic problems, your uh, communication needs, all right there in that universal service program. One of the key purposes of that was enshrined in the 1996 Act, and it said that rural households should have the same access to advanced telecommunications enjoyed by their urban counterparts. Um, good goal, and good goal for lots of reasons. I saw some figures just this week where when you look at the uh, overdose deaths, the opioid problems in the country, they're much greater 
at least in many states in, in, in rural counties than they are in urban centers. Uh, in our state, uh, Kansas City, now our biggest city by population, Kansas City and any of the, the five counties that touched it weren't anywhere close to the top list of, peop of, of other areas in our state that had this problem. It matters when you're not connected. It matters when opportunities that you'd otherwise have just simply aren't there because somehow a service that is essential in our society today isn't available to you in the same way it's available. It's not, not nobody's saying it should be free to you and cost other people something, but available to you, like the 1996 Telecommunications Act said, um, in the same way that it's available to others in, uh, in our society. It's necessary to attract business. It's necessary to retain uh, business uh, from banks, from factories, from distribution centers to small businesses. Necessary to start and maintain uh, a business, large or small. If you're going to have, if that business is going to compete outside the local marketplace, you have to have that connectedness. And frankly, if you're going to compete in the local marketplace, and you're going to be able to buy at the best price uh, and get the kind of, of product you need when you need it, uh, the internet really matters. Uh, broadband is always. Uh, uh, there to, uh, you have to have it if you're going to compete in a world economy. And many people in rural America are able to do that in ways that nobody would have dreamed about 10 years ago, uh, but not everybody has that same access. It's certainly critical for schools and libraries. Uh, just today, a parent was telling me, you know, you really can't do the homework anymore unless you can get access somewhere close to you, where you live to all the ways that that information is now available to kids. Students dependent on the internet for education and opportunity uh, in where we live today. Agriculture, you know, revolution's taken place in agriculture, the great food producing economy that we have produces more food all the time. It actually produces more few food with fewer people, so that creates some displaced people who otherwise would have had those jobs. But it also uses wireless infrastructure. It uses data, the, the GPS uh, structure to decide what should happen in a field at a given time in that part of the field. Uh, data centers, uh, uh, autonomous systems, fiber optics, part of agriculture today. Uh, but if you can, you're linked to broadband and you're in your, your combine and you've got a problem, sometimes that problem can be solved in just a couple of minutes by quickly accessing your system, seeing where the problem is, resetting what you need to set, and moving on, as opposed to the other option, which is calling the repair person, having the technologist come out with their computer, hook it up to your combine, and five or six hours later, at a time when you're at the critical moments of your annual livelihood, suddenly you're working again, when you could have been working five or six minutes later, if you'd have been connected like many farmers are today. You know, it's more than just rural, more than just economic opportunity as well. Healthcare, rural hospitals and health clinics are able to use telemedicine to bring services at a level that the otherwise would not be available. Uh, this is particularly important in, in mental health, and by the way, in mental and behavioral health care. A lot of people are every bit as comfortable, and a lot of people are even more comfortable with telehealth uh, than they are with somebody in the room with them. Intensive care, where suddenly you bring all of the resources that may be available 100 miles away right there to the, situ to the, the point where questions are asked, information is handled, and suddenly somebody's life is saved because you had the capacity to have that kind of communication. Uh, for years, I've, I've tried to lead when I could, join my colleagues when they were leading on numerous letters to the FCC, urging it to reform the Universal Service Fund program. Uh, so it now counts for the digital area. Most people that don't have a line to their phone have a way to get a phone in their hand now, but they don't have a way to get this important way to communicate and to compete. Um, 
it's frustrating when we see the limited resources we have, the government resources to put into something like this, to see this go to places where you're just creating another provider and more competition, except the second provider has government money on their side to compete with the first provider who went in with their own money. You know, there's a big difference, Mr. President, between unserved and any level of underserved. If you're unserved, like 69% of rural Missourians, uh, the, the idea that somebody else doesn't have enough competition in the place they live doesn't seem to make very much sense to you. But if there's a competitive marketplace and somebody else wants to go in there and compete and get the prices down, that's all fine. But I think the government focus should be just like it was with telephones 100 years ago to see that people had the opportunity to have that phone if they could afford to pay what their neighbors in more densely populated areas were, were paying. Uh, the President recently designated uh, Agent Pai to be the chairman of the FCC. Uh, we're finally seeing the commission, I think, take actions to address rural broadband. Uh, in February, I wrote the chairman and urged him to act on, a, on the $2 billion available for rural broadband and to open this money up to, uh, to auction uh, new entrants into the field, uh, like electric co-ops, uh, so they could competitively bid alongside everybody else. Uh, the FCC's decided to do that, and tomorrow the Commission will consider a notice to initiate the pre-auction process for this money to deploy fiber optics in parts of Missouri. Uh, this will compete with other initiatives underway uh, as the FCC looks at how to address rural broad broadband. They've launched a $4.5 billion auction for mobile wireless service in rural areas. Uh, suspending out-of-date rules that force small carriers to raise telephone rates in order to have broadband available. Launching a, a proceeding to reduce costs for companies upgrading from copper to fiber op optic uh, networks, another FCC initiative, uh, launching a broadband advisory committee. These are all steps, Mr. President, in the right direction. Where you live and where I live, they make a difference. I look forward to continuing to work with the chairman and others on the, on the commission uh, on this issue and others. Uh, I think rural broadband is particularly leveling in creating the opportunities that we'd like to see. Uh, the commission now will be back up uh, to its five-member uh, intention of how many people are supposed to be there making that decisions. Uh, there's still work to be done. We need to reduce the digital divide. Connectivity is critical, uh, but we also need policies that, uh, that support uh, uh, efficient uh, network structures that allow people to not just connect to a network, but to connect to a network that really works. Let me talk about one other Missouri issue that relates here in Kansas City, which I said earlier, now our, our biggest city, our most populous city. Um, St. Louis, still I think by region, the bigger region, but St. Louis City not as big as Kansas City. I'm, uh, but in Kansas City they have an internet exchange called KCIX. And what KCIX is is a peering center that offers tremendous benefits to secondary educational institutions, to other high schools, to vocational programs, to others, so that they really maximize how they communicate with each other and the availability of resources in one place much more equally available in the others. Large amounts of bandwidth, uh, these uh, you can divert by using this peering infrastructure. And, and frankly, what's happening in Kansas City, where the, the, this fall the North Kansas City School District will establish connections also to KCIX, uh, and it's estimated that it may save the district almost $500,000 a year in bandwidth fees just by looking at peering. Uh, so if peering helps there, maybe peering is one of the other things that we can look at that helps solve the rural broadband challenge as well. Uh, we're we're going to be working on this. There'll be legislation. There'll be continuing efforts to urge the FCC to stay on point. Uh, we need to do what we can to make communities in rural America productive and competitive. 
and as healthy as they can be. And by the way, Mr. President, there are a lot of stories here to be told. Uh, I hope the next time I come to the floor on this topic, I'm going to come to the floor with some things that are happening in my state uh, that wouldn't have happened if they hadn't had access to broadband in not very big communities that are suddenly doing business all over the United States and all over the world and how they do that, uh, not letting any of our country wither away where we have existing infrastructure and schools and sidewalks and water systems uh, and being sure that people who want to live there can live there, just like we're being sure now as we see a revitalization of some of our downtowns and inner cities, that people want to move back to that, have, a, have, have reasons and desires to want to do that. We're seeing an upswing there. I think we can see the same kind of thing happen uh, in uh, other parts of the country if we work to be sure that, that we have equity uh, of uh, opportunity and one of the major things that will provide that will be access to broadband that works and uh, I hope we can continue to fight that fight and see the progress we've seen just in the last six months. And uh, Mr. President, I believe there's an absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll.